Hi, and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk a lot about urine. So if pee is not your thing, this might not be your episode. But we are also going to talk about 350 goats who had to be flown out of a national park because they couldn't stop licking human pee on hiking trails, an undersea crustacean who pees out of his face, and the slowest race in sports. There's no pee in that one. It's just super cute. All right, let's go. Hi again. Welcome back to Bewilder Beasts. I don't know about you, but for me, we've been doing a lot more walking. We can't go to places like Legoland or the library or a coffee shop. We can't go to indoor facilities to get any relief or respite with COVID. But we can walk and we can hike and we can explore outside, which for city kids, we don't get to do that very often. Or we might not think of that as the first thing we can do. And if you live in an urban environment like we do, your inclination isn't necessarily to get in the car to go walk in the woods, though for some people it is. But I'm going to guess that none of you, at least on the eastern seaboard, have ever run into an animal like when you're out going pee and there's no Starbucks around and you have to listen to nature's call. You're not going to be stared down by a linebacker of a goat who wants to drink your urine. That's not something that I think I've ever dealt with, and I'm pretty sure I'd remember. So yeah, we're going to be talking about those goats in the second part of today's episode. But first, we're going to see how fast your escargot can really go. My husband is a basketball fan, and thankfully, because the NBA and WNBA were able to stay fully potted up in a secure bubble with no one new coming in, no one leaving and coming back, we were able to see some sports this year. But now that games are over and a long winter is ahead of us, we have YouTube and my new favorite sport, snail racing. Ready? Set. Slow. And while people generally giggle, by the time the laughing tapers off, this is the one sport where the contestants are still usually firmly where they were when the race started. The contestants go on through a rigorous training program. We take this seriously, said snail racer John McLean, talking to Reuters. We've got training slopes, we look at diet, we are drug compliant as well. It is the whole thing when you look at elite sports, though I am imagining... A little snail with a little barbell on steroids. The way these races work, the snails are placed on a damp mat and have to travel 13 inches. Now, on this podcast, I like to put these numbers into context. But truly, 13 inches is basically a ruler and a little bit. That might just be like us climbing the Tower of Pisa, though, to a snail. This sport was created in the 1960s because... Oh, the 60s. And each race takes several minutes. And while the Kentucky Derby is the fastest two minutes in sports, I suspect that snail racing might be the longest. In 2018, several mountain goats had to be airlifted to a more serene, quiet, less human-y area. These aren't the cute little goats that you see at the petting zoo. These sure-footed cliff climbers can weigh as much as 310 pounds. And while that's not usually an issue, it is when they're chasing you down because they want your pee. Yep. Your pee. I mean, they also want your sweat. Your sweat is also a coveted resource for these goats, but I just thought the pee would get your attention more easily. So why are these goats attacking people in national parks for pee and sweat? Well, it turns out that they were looking for minerals and salt. They also hate predators because, you know, like me, they like living and hate being eaten. Mountain goats can scale cliffs, nearly flat rock faces. They can leap up to 12 feet in a single bound. Superman, eat your heart out. 
all to get away from predators. And some very smart goats realized that where people are, predators are generally not. So they started hanging out on trails where humans tended to congregate. And there was this bonus. Our pee and sweat. Goats are known to travel up to 15 miles just to get salt from a natural salt mine. This is a necessary mineral for goats. But why walk 15 miles? If you can just follow people around and lap up their urine when they duck behind a bush when nature calls. Over time, hikers started noticing that when they would find their primo peeing spot and pop a squat, goats would be staring at them. 309 pounds of goat. That's a linebacker of goat, watching, waiting, lurking while you pee. Not cool, goat. Not cool. And in 2010, a hiker was killed by a goat. Robert Borman was hiking with his wife when a goat had appeared and instead of being shooed away, as most animals will respond to, this one came in aggressively and gored Robert in the leg with his antler. He died on his way to the hospital from his injuries. The theory is that this goat was looking for salt, pee, something, and just became increasingly more aggressive towards humans. Rangers had tried desperately to make the goat afraid of people by hazing. In this case, the term hazing is used to indicate that rangers would just shoot the goat with bean bags and throw rocks in its general direction, with the intention to make this goat afraid of people. This can work, and many animals will turn away and create distance from humans if they think that humans might hurt them. But some others, like maybe this goat, they might have become increasingly aggressive as a result of being hurt and scared. And instead of learning humans hurt me, I should leave them alone, which was the intent. This goat had likely sorted out that humans have a valuable resource that I want and need. And they hurt me, so to get the resource, I will have to do whatever it takes. This is an example as why it's imperative to leave all wildlife alone, even if they seem docile and cute for you when you approach. In recent years, lots of goats, buffalo, and other animals in national parks have made headlines by harming humans who got too close for a selfie, or the intention to say hi. This is your weekly reminder that the cuteness of an animal is not permission to come into its space. Because while that animal might be okay with you for your singular interaction over time, that animal could lose its fear of humans and might end up hurting someone or losing its life. Which is the case of the goat in the story above. He was killed by rangers to make sure he couldn't hurt anybody else again. And that's unfortunately what can happen when we infringe on their space, feed them, and don't give them the space they need, and respect them as wild animals. But additionally, if goats don't do their yearly migration to the mineral lick hotspots, the moms aren't passing that journey on to their kids. <laughs> and that means the younger generation of goats cannot learn that journey, the skills, the everything. And they become dependent on humans even more so in a way that is unhealthy and can ultimately harm them. These migrations have occurred for thousands of years, and to lose that because they want our leftover Gatorade is actually quite sad. However, as I hope this podcast is entertaining as well as educational, this is not all doom and gloom. Researchers and rangers have come up with a genius way to help these goats stay away from people. They realized that they could use helicopters to airlift the goats to a more remote area of national parks. They'll still be protected, but will have fewer interactions with humans. For example, Logan Pass might have up to 3,500 people every single day and animals might see 400 people an hour. That's not that much less people than the number of students in my daughter's school, every hour passing you by all day long. So what is driving these goats to people? Is it aversion to predators? Or is it the draw to our, you know? Liquid gold. Well, scientists looked at Logan Pass, the same place that had over 400 people per hour passing, which was a huge draw for the goats. But in 2015, the area was shut down due to forest fires, so scientists jumped in and did science. The best kind of science. The 
Dress up as a bear and walk around a national park for science science. Yes, some scientists just get to visit the Halloween store in the off-season. Others might have extracurricular hobbies that they can write off as a, quote, science experiment. Ah! It seemed like the predators and the safety that humans unwittingly offer that drove most of the goats' behavior of getting just too close and changing migratory patterns. How do we know this? While the goats who saw humans only on occasion ran over 600 feet more when they encountered scientist Bear Man. Ah! So how far is 600 feet? The Pyramid of Giza is 470 feet, so it's further than the height of the pyramid. It's about as tall as the Space Needle, a smidge taller than the Washington Monument. It's significant. These goats had figured out if people are around, they don't have to run as far from predators, or at least they don't have to run from a scientist in a bear suit. In 2018, the goal of moving these goats to their native area, the other side of the Cascades, by teams including, quote, muggers and gunners, I'm guessing the gunners darted and sedated the goats, the muggers blindfolded them and put them in carriers dangling at the bottom of the helicopter for relocation. Muggers, gunners, blindfolding, goats... I think what we have here is a kidnapping. And a really bad goat pun. If you looked in the sky in the west coast, it is likely at this time you would have seen helicopters flying overhead with up to three goats dangling from the choppers and going toward their new home. Well, really their old home. In the Cascade Mountains. From North California through Seattle to British Columbia, the Cascade Mountains range. And now 350 goats also now call this home. But why relocate to here? Well, in the 1920s, humans, in a tale as old as time, moved the goats thinking it was a good idea to the Olympic Mountains. It turns out that these goats moved long before the national park they now reside in was founded. They were brought by a local hunting club in a wildlife management strategy that usually backfires eventually, two goats were brought down from Alaska and released. Instead of the serene, peaceful, unabashed curiosity and maybe a goat looking over his shoulder in a, wow, thanks guys, this place, it's, it's beautiful and bountiful. Maybe a couple of Disney birds floating down and a nice flute for ambiance. No, these goats just put their heads down and immediately charged at the ranger who had to think quick and climb a tree to escape the razor-sharp antlers on these goats that were trying to kill him. Meanwhile, on the other side of Puget Sound, the mountain goat population is depleting. So let's handle two problems with one solution. Move in the urine-seeking Capricorns away from humans and repopulate the land that they originated from. And scientists... Love, 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 love getting data. Almost as much as dressing up as creepy bears and maybe as much as mountain goats love your pee. So collaring these goats with GPS is basically how you can make a scientist feel like they are a kid on Christmas. These goats were collared with GPS tracking and released in 2018. And if you're curious about what it looks like when helicopters fly overhead with goats dangling from them, go ahead and look up the BuzzFeed article that is linked in the description of today's episode. You can also Google helicoptering goats or, you know, just go down a YouTube rabbit hole. Goat hole? Mm, I'll workshop it. Lobsters. They're right wicked good. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I slipped into my native tongue. See, while I am recording from Boston, I grew up in a tiny town in Maine. Yes, Bob, I'm a Maina. One of the first memories I have of traveling was when I was 17. I went to Las Vegas with my mom and my stepdad. Growing up in Maine, I had never seen a palm tree in person. So when I got off the plane, I ran to the first palm tree I could to touch it, to see how it felt differently from any other tree that I knew but also to get the old point-and-click tourist photo by a palm tree. My stepfather took the picture, and when the camera film was developed months later, see, digital wasn't a thing, we saw my expression. It wasn't that of elation and joy, which is what I felt when I saw that tree. 
My mouth was smiling in the photo, but my eyes were sideways, squinting and confused. My stepfather had captured the exact second that I realized the palm tree I was posing with had on it a poster taped to the trunk, and on the sign was an advertisement for Fresh Maine Lobster. I promise you, if this lobster isn't straight out of the water, it is not fresh. I was thinking about that when I saw a How Stuff Works Instagram photo on how lobsters pee out of their faces. True. See, below their antenna are the glands where they express their pee. And by express their pee, I don't mean just shoot it out of their faces, which they do. I mean they also use it to express themselves in fights, and females use it to calm males before mating so he doesn't eat her. All of this communication is done by peeing on lobsters' faces. From lobsters' faces. Additionally, lobsters have two claws. One is famously larger than the other, called the crusher claw, which is used to crack open shells of prey. The other claw, the cutter, tears bits of food up for digestion. They almost look like a squirrel when they eat. You know, a less furry, antenna pee out of the face squirrel. If a lobster were to lose a claw or a walking leg, that could be disastrous for the lobster, but never fear, the limb will grow back, regenerate. If you've seen a lobster with two thumbs or an extra leg, it's not necessarily because it was exposed to radiation like Blinky the fish from The Simpsons, but it's more likely that when the injury was caused, it happened to be around the time of the lobster molting, or shedding its hard shell, which it can do several times a year until it becomes about a pound in weight. And then after that, it only molts once a year. But if an injury happens at the time of molting, well, some biochemical signals get mixed up. Chemically, hormonally, lobsterally, and then they regenerate twice what they might need. Another note on their molting, when they do bust out of their shell, their new shells are super soft. If they were to be taken out of the water right after a molt, their claws can fall off because the shell hadn't set yet. They shed every piece of their shells, every part of their body that is hard. And that would also include the outside of their intestines. When I grew up, most of my friends either went lobstering, knew someone in their family who fished for lobster, or worked somehow in the lobster industry. Restaurants, bars, packing plants, all of it. Everyone knew growing up that you could guess a lobster's age by their size. But we have a more accurate way now to tell how old a lobster is, and it comes down to the way we figure out how old trees are. You count the rings. In this case, every time a lobster goes through a molt and it loses its shell, it grows 20% in size. So by looking at the rings of the eye stalk, those antenna-looking things where their eyes are just kind of planted on top of, you can accurately determine the age of the lobster. Just be sure you don't push too hard on the wrong antenna or stalk, lest you get peed on. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, if you know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, animals that would make you feel better to hear about, or wacky animals in the news, please send them along to bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod, Bewilder Beasts on Facebook, and Bewilder Beasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from ForksForum.com, HuffPost on goats thirsting for human pee, New York Times, FoxNews.com, Wikipedia.org, Mental Floss, and the BBC. I also got information today, or inspiration today, from a How Stuff Works Instagram post on lobster face pee. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episodes. Intro music and outro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. And honestly, sharing this podcast and talking about it with your friends, with your family, 
the more you talk about this, the more other people can find it. So do that and all those other things that everyone else with a podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening.